This is unreal. I mean, it can't be. Thanks. You're not really, uh... Uh... Huh, Doc? You know, this is beginning to seriously undermine my self-esteem. I'm sorry. I guess I should thank you for chasing those guys off. Are you okay? Yeah, sure. Terrific. I just have one giant question. Where am I? Oh, well, uh, the lights up there on 9th Street and the bus stops at the corner of Powell. No, 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 no. I'm asking, what is this place? Uh, Cleveland. Cleveland? Uh-huh. That's a perfect weird name for this planet. Planet? No, no, that's the city. The planet's... A... You don't know the planet? Oh, well. The planet's called Earth, I think. And I'm obviously in some sort of terrible nightmare. Oh, yeah? Your nightmare or mine? Got rights, you know. I'm suing. Tell him he ain't coming home. Oi, 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 oi. The dog human race called him out. The dog. The way he can feel it. He's a brother's touch. I love him. That, that's a duck, man. Ow. I've given up trying to assimilate. Why I hate the night shift. Maybe you're here for some greater purpose. Save the human race. And soon the dark overlords will engulf the earth. This relationship it defies all the laws of nature. Well, we want to know why the harassing power. Please help me! No more, Mr. Nice Duck. Trust your birdness. Fly! sent me here to save Earth, then Howard the Duck is ready to fight! The comics were uh, a thing I had always been interested in, but my main interest was in television and film and, uh, and broadcasting up until I got involved in the comics. But the human direction was always, you know, more, more the place I was headed anyway, even with the comics. I mean, uh, spent a lot of time just breaking conventions wherever I could find them. I mean, not, not gathering, <laughs> not, not comic book conventions. Well, comic book conventions, but conventions of the media, I was going to find them. And it's always the best in that case. The early returns for President Nixon as expected out in front of them. A most original fragrance. And their washable no portrait polyester. The J.C. Penny slack. Only $13. Bring her on the collar. Bring her on the collar. The oil-producing countries of the Arab world decided to use their oil as a political weapon. We are heading for the most acute shortages of energy since World War II. The best chicken parts always look for this tag. And if anyone tells you the tag fell off, including two women were shot and killed on Kent State University's campus today during renewed demonstrations involving hundreds. I said welcome to our New Year's Eve party. The use of a ceasefire agreement for Vietnam has been concluded. And say cheeseburger. Cheeseburger. People have been arrested and charged with breaking into the headquarters of the Democratic National Committee. I shall resign the presidency effective at noon tomorrow. Don't have to worry about him squeezing Sherman's bathroom dish. With Colonel Sanders' original teachers. Two-way speakers and your choice of an eight-track or cassette player recorder. Ah!
A militant minority of women's liberationists was on the streets to demand equal employment for women. All here at your Winnebago dealers, seven disco. A local disc jockey blew up disco records in Southern Americans took the day off for the national birthday. There's nothing birthday more really than a folks screen for censorship. With some strange things about how hot dogs are made. What are you going to do, you think? Oh, it's a full-on smash. The egg technique, sharp crack. Oh, Elvis <laughs> Presley died today. He was 42. Apparently, it was a heart attack. No predict how long Patty Hose will last between you and your friends. And then we're told she had a gun in her hand. Actually, uh, what I am is evil and fun. Introducing Pop Rocks, Franklin Candy. It has been one hour since we first saw this post. Oh, no, no. Different coffees taste different. This and means... And, uh, uh, every... Oh, oh, oh. Mr. Moon is regarded as a messiah. Today, one out of every four turkeys sold is during the What you're about to see almost defies description, and some of you may not want to watch. ask us, how did you two become Johnny and As opposed to, let's say, Marty and Janet. Get your head out and yell. I'm as bad as hell, but I'm not going to take this anymore. Every trip at the supermarkets, shop, cities collapsing. Suburbs, scare, policemen check. Have you got any new projects in America? Howard the Duck is now in the papers. But we're mostly concerned now with television and movies. We are presently negotiating. Howard the Duck was created by writer Steve Gerber in 1973. Howard would make his first appearance in Adventure into Fear number 19. The cigar-chomping, pantless Mallard would be a supporting character, adding his own brand of abrasive perspective to the proceedings, until his apparent death in the final panels. Fan reaction to the character was immediate. Letters poured into Marvel with positive reactions over him. It was clear he gained some fans who wanted to see more of him, and the idea of killing him off so quickly wasn't too appreciated. Legend has it that one passionate fan of this new character sent a large package to the Marvel offices, containing the carcass of a dead duck with a note that simply read, Murderers. I can't confirm if this story is true. I hope it is. Several months later, the waters were tested with the return of Howard in the pages of Giant Size Man-Thing. Fans still clamored for more, so eventually Howard began headlining his own comic title in 1976. At first glance, one might assume a talking animal book was geared for little kids. But once opening the pages, you would learn that wasn't Howard's intended target audience by any stretch. Howard was a character meant to bring a skewed point of view to standard comic adventures. He was an intelligent anti-hero in an existential crisis. He felt alienated. He was brash. He took great joy in puncturing pomposity in the people he encountered. He would not so subtly clue the reader in on how silly things were getting, and mock the conventions of comic books. He deplored violence, had a nervous breakdown, and made a run for the presidency, which not surprisingly allowed plenty of jabs at the political climate at the time. The comic would be less about superheroics and more satire. A duck from another world trapped in the burg of Cleveland, having to live in a crazy world made him even grumpier, he would end up shacking up with the cute Beverly Switzer while bitching about the economy, consumerism, and the injustices in this wacky, hairless ape world. Howard was meant to satirize politics, religion, pop culture, and the nature of comic books themselves to a degree that was never found before in a comic book rack at the supermarket. Gerber brought a counterculture attitude to the pages of Howard's stories. It was more socially relevant than anything Marvel had ever published before. Gerber would describe the main joke of Howard as being life's most serious moments and most incredibly dumb moments are often indistinguishable, only by a momentary point of view. There had been cult comics before that were targeted to niche audiences, but the success of Howard and the fact that one of the two big comic publishers at the time was behind it was very unique. By 1977, Howard had gained enough popularity, he was given his own daily newspaper strip. There were problems along the way. Disney threatened legal action against Marvel, citing the similarities between Howard and Donald Duck. As a result, Howard was redesigned and made to wear pants. Howard would enjoy a degree of success until Gerber and Marvel clashed over creative control. 
Gerber was unhappy with the direction they wanted to go in with Howard. Gerber felt they wanted to dumb him down in order to cater to the kitty market. Around the 27th issue, Gerber was removed from the Howard comic. He would eventually get into a dispute with the rights of ownership to Howard, feeling if he left Marvel, he should be able to take Howard with him, and he filed a lawsuit against them. It was one of the first cases to bring the issue of creator's rights to wide public attention. The case would be settled out of court. The settlement was undisclosed, but Howard would stay with Marvel. Gerber would receive a created by credit whenever they used the character in the future. Howard's comic would limp to issue number 31, with other writers taking over, at which point it was canceled. Howard would continue to make sporadic brief appearances in the pages of Marvel Comics, but he would never regain the same level of popularity he had when he was in the hands of his creator in his early years. Meanwhile, filmmaker George Lucas exploded on the scene with his 1977 blockbuster, Star Wars. It would become one of the most popular movies of all time. It would set Lucas out on a road to success that was unparalleled. Other than his pal Steven Spielberg, Lucas was one of the most beloved filmmakers during that time. He would become the producer of two Star Wars sequels, each one being monster hits. He would also team with Spielberg to make Raiders of the Lost Ark and introduce the iconic hero Indiana Jones to audiences. Again, it was a huge hit. Along with the millions he was earning with his films, there was the income that was pouring in from Star Wars merchandise, which he owned. He used this newly earned power to create his own special effects studio, along with other projects. Despite seeming so busy with so many stories and ideas running through his head, Lucas had found the time to read the Howard the Duck comics by Gerber and fell in love with them. In 1984, with the release of Indiana Jones and the Temple of Doom, Lucas was the most powerful filmmaker around. He could do anything he wanted, and audiences were sure to follow him. His name was associated with top quality movie magic, and guaranteed excitement that was sure to leave audiences dazzled. Everyone wanted to see what Lucas was going to do next. I want a new duck, one that won't try to bite. One that won't chew a hole in my socks. One that won't quack all night. I want to Okay, so director Willard Hewick and his wife, writer-producer Gloria Katz, say that initially, Howard was meant to be an animated film. However, Universal needed a big tentpole movie to release in the summer of 1986. And at the time, Lucas was contractually obligated to make a live-action movie for them. Hence... Let's do a live-action Howard the Duck. Whatever behind-the-scenes antics were going on, and however it happened, Howard the Duck would become the first live-action theatrical film starring a Marvel character. If you don't count the Captain America serials from the 1940s. Now being a live-action movie, with Lucas's name attached, with lots of special effects, including a talking duck as the hero, and meant to be a big summer event movie, the budget increased, and expectations rose. The script distanced itself from the surreal and satiric tone of the Howard comics and became a more straightforward special effects adventure. It had plenty of scenes for Lucas's industrial light and magic to create their movie magic. The budget for Howard the Duck was estimated at between 35 to 40 million dollars, much more than if they had stuck with the smaller animated movie idea. In fact, I always thought doing an animated movie would have been the way to go with this. Howard was more of a cult sensation. Not everyone got him. So you present him in more of a smaller cultish arena. Stick with the tone that garnered him attention and fans in the first place. And be aware that not everyone will get it. By pouring all this money into a movie to showcase him in, hoping he'll attain mainstream success and watering down the main components of the character and the point of his existence, it seems to be the direct opposite of why you would want to make the movie about this character in the first place. I mean, listen, this is a movie about a duck from outer space. It's not supposed to be, you know, an existential experience here. See, that's not what the comic was all about. 
already you can start to see trouble. But you know, I have to hand it to Lucas that he was passionate enough to adapt this character into a movie, and actually went ahead and did it in the first place. He had all this money and power, could make any movie he wanted, and decided on Howard just because he personally was a fan of the comics. That's what I think would be the great benefit of having that kind of control and influence as a filmmaker. Be able to make projects that maybe no one else would ever do, but you will just because you want to. I know if I had that power, I would adapt some funny animal stuff I used to love when I was little. It's time to bring those guys back. The film begins on Howard's home planet of Duck World. Already a diversion from Gerber's version of Howard. In the stories he had written, readers were never shown Howard's home planet. It wasn't even named, he just appeared on Earth. Duck World was an invention by another writer, an all duck planet in a parallel dimension with duck equivalents to characters, like Doctor Strange. Gerber hated the idea of Duck World. In fact, when he almost got to return to write new stories for Howard in the mid 80s, his first priority was to set out to eliminate Duck World from Howard's continuity and undo the damage he felt was done to his character by Marvel. This idea was nixed by Marvel, and Duck World stayed as is. So yep, here's Duck World, with probably everything that Gerber hated about the idea. Duck puns galore. I never really thought any of them were particularly funny or clever. And all these puns take up the whole introduction to this character. There was attempted build-up to what did Howard look like at the time, the commercials, trailers, and ads never showed him. I think they were trying to pull off enticing everyone, building some mystery to it, and pulling off a big reveal like Gremlins did. So we see Howard, and, you know, it's not that big of a deal. He kind of looks like something you'd see in a parade or an amusement park. I suppose it was the best kind of costume they could do at the time, and they managed to get some expression out of his face sometimes, but... For a title character in the movie, it's not that impressive. I always thought it was weird that there was flesh color around his eyes, too. It makes him look a bit creepy. They should have just done him all white. But setting that aside, here's our introduction to our main character. The opening few minutes of the story. And we really don't learn too much about Howard during this. We hear his mom call saying he got a new job. We see some silly pictures hanging around, but that's it. They sacrifice this scene of us first getting to meet this guy for the sake of doing some lame duck gags. Yeah, okay, we learn he got a new job. No idea if he likes it or is it a crummy job or what. Okay, he plays in a band, which is fine. It comes into play later at the concert and stuff, but that's it? Nothing really about his personality. There's a picture of him as a hippie. Does he still have counterculture beliefs? Is he a reformed radical? Instead, we channel surf, watching duck parodies of TV shows and commercials. When you look at it, it's a lot of wasted time and energy on nothing. They should have had him talking with his landlord or doing something to start establishing him as a character, rather than doing all these duck jokes. Like We get the idea. Yeah, he's a duck. I know you're probably thinking, oh brother, it's just the first scene. Why are you carrying on about this duck? We just met him. We get to see his apartment, him coming home from his day. What do you expect in this first scene? I'm only pointing this out because it's a problem I have with this main character for the rest of the movie. I don't know who Howard is. I don't grow to like him, and I don't find myself rooting for him during the entire story. I always felt if you took away the fact he's this little three-foot duck, there would be absolutely nothing interesting about him. Let's say you don't change anything about this character we meet in this movie, but just make him Howard the Human. You can't rely on the duck jokes or the visual gags. There he is. Now, he's really not that intriguing a fellow. They spent all this time on this costume wanting to make a movie starring this character, and they forgot to make him something special, distinctive, give him a strong personality. The comic Howard was abrasive, grumpy, sarcastic, he voiced strong opinions about his surroundings and the people around him. He was quite a colorful character. Here, I guess they want to make Howard a much less offensive character and make him more accessible to audiences. 
so they make him boring. Him being a duck was apparently as far as it goes, and that little trait gets old really, really fast. Another thing to point out here is the odd tone the movie quickly establishes, too. A lot of the criticism that got hurled at the movie was for not knowing who it was made for. It goes back and forth between silly childish humor to more adult-oriented strangeness. There's no consistency to the overall tone of the movie. And this is demonstrated right here in this opening scene. It starts with a film noirish kind of opening. Then the silly puns begin. Indiana Drake poster, My Little Chickadee poster, Splash Dance poster. Is Howard a big movie fan or something? Rolling Egg magazine. Like, how many times can you use the words duck, quack, fowl, mallard, feather for jokes? They're really stretching the gag. These are awfully juvenile kind of gags. I would guess kids would enjoy them more than adults. After a few more of those, we immediately segue into a commercial for Duck Jock Itch. Howard then looks at a centerfold in Play Duck, and of course the notorious topless bathing duck. And I'm not entirely sure, but is this supposed to be a hooker duck in the elevator? It kind of looks like Construction Duck is feeling her up or something. I'm not sure what to make of this. I mean, she does look a bit trampy. So, it's already weird. Not even five minutes into this movie, it probably already had both adults and kids confused and not knowing what to expect next. Howard gets scooped up out of his living room and lands in Cleveland. He runs around panicked as he encounters all the threatening residents. Until he meets Beverly Switzer. There's always been two things I liked about this movie, and the first is Leah Thompson. She is so unbelievably adorable looking in this. With her hair, the rock and roll clothes, she looks so good. She's like a more harmless, virginal version of Lita Ford. It's ironic with all the money that was poured into this movie, with the special effects, the costumes and all that, one of the most memorable moments that was left on those who actually went to see Howard the Duck was Leah Thompson in her panties. That left quite an impression. It probably didn't even cost that much either. The movie is sort of broken up in two halves. The first half is Howard getting bewildered reactions from Earthlings, trying to adapt to his surroundings, and trying to figure out how he got here. This is where wannabe scientist Phil comes in. Tim Robbins is Phil, and I don't think he could have played this guy any wackier. He's all zany, he's a doofus, he screams a lot. It's a very spazzy performance. I remember at the time when I first saw this movie, recognizing him as the guy from Fraternity Vacation, and thinking, boy, we're never going to see this guy again. Some silly duck jokes commence, along with onlookers either being fascinated or shocked by Howard. That's pretty much what most of the scenes consist of, until Howard abandons Beverly, which kind of comes out of nowhere, too. I don't need any more of your sympathy, your charity. Okay. Okay, fine. I mean, I just found something. Huh? I mean, somebody in a pretty weird predicament, and I was trying to help. I'm not sure why he gets so mad at her. She was just trying to help. He comes off kind of jerky. So he heads out into this strange world on his own. This is where you would think some topical and insightful humor will come in. It doesn't. The standard fish-out-of-water scenario. Or in this case, a duck-out-of-water one. When done right, it can get some laughs, taking jabs at the seemingly ridiculous setting the character's now in. Whether the filmmakers were forced into it or not, here Howard is a brand new visitor on Earth. So you might as well make the most out of that idea and come up with some observations about how unusual he finds this place. There should be a lot of potential here. In 1986, there was enough going on to poke fun at. That doesn't really happen. Howard tries to get a job, and the only gag out of this scene is he's wearing kitty clothes. And he tries biting this lady's ass. I never understood that. So Howard gets a job at... some kind of hot tub place or something. It looks like there's some... pretty weird things going on in here. 
This whole thing doesn't look like something that should be in this movie. They had to know kids were potentially going to want to see this, so this hot tub scene seems kind of inappropriate. And I'm not a prude. I'm not offended by this. But I think it was a very strange decision. Had this been an adult animated feature about Howard and he gets a job at a spa where the customers are getting it on, then, you know, fine. But here, it's a huge miscalculation. They should have had him be a lifeguard at a kiddie pool or something. They could have still used the gag of him not being able to swim. But even worse is that plunking Howard down in this environment does not result in any laughs. He doesn't do anything funny. It's a really weird scene. I don't know what they were thinking. Like if they really thought this was funny or... You know, a couple of months after Howard would be released, one of the biggest hits of 1986 would come out and use the similar premise of A Stranger in a Strange Land in a much more effective comedic way. Nick Dundee from Australia. How are you? I'm fine, how are you? Mick Dundee, a crocodile hunter, would be dumped into modern society. The peculiar setting of New York City, its residents, the lifestyle, and technological wonders would throw this outback adventurer for a loop as he tries to adapt to it all. There's a TV if you get bored. Oh, uh, tell me. Yeah, I saw that Darkie Johnson's place years ago. Yep. That's what I saw. Howard the Duck just gets a job in a sex spa. Oh, and he watches TVs and sees duck-related abuse going on. Whoopee. Most people will complain about Howard and say, It's so silly. It's stupid duck jokes. Why would they think anyone would want to see a talking duck movie? I don't have any doubt that the movie could have been better, and they could have pulled this off and got audiences in more of the spirit of it. Instead, it's a lazy story, and all it really has are the duck jokes. Not that I'm a big fan of it, but Ted had a similar-sounding goofy premise, and no one was really taking pot shots at that. Audiences got intrigued by the idea of a talking teddy bear. They rolled with it, and made it a big hit. One reason was probably because the movie actually gave the character Ted more of a dynamic personality than Howard has. Ted was funny. He was rude. There was more going on with him than just being a talking teddy bear. The humor also didn't just rely on bear jokes. There was pot jokes and pop culture references. There's really nothing to Howard's movie. In the comics, people first encountering Howard would obviously react with, You're a duck! But then Howard would have things to say. In the movie, he doesn't. It just stops with, You're a duck. What is that? That's a what duck! That's a duck, man! Anyway, Howard flees back to Beverly and relieves her band manager of his duties. Phil takes a feather specimen. You don't. <laughs> Stay away from me! Uh, Phil, leave Let me, me through! Ow, ow. I actually kind of like that moment just because it causes Howard pain and humiliation. Like I said, I'm not crazy about this duck. That brings us to one of the most often joked about scenes in the movie. The love scene. Most people talk about how ridiculous and crazy it is, and it is, but I actually like it. In fact, I think it's the best scene from the whole movie. It's not even really a love scene, it's just Bev calling Howard on his flirtations and embarrassing him. I think Leah is pretty good here, and it's one of the more genuine moments in the movie between these two. They could have done without the feathers going up on Howard's head, though. It's not really the best gag. Let's just face it. It's fate. No, it's not. <sighs> I've got a headache. And I got the aspirin. <gasps> Be gentle. Now the movie moves into its second half, which is basically a chase movie. Dr. Jennings arrives on the scene to explain the circumstances of how Howard arrived on Earth. Some kind of powerful laser went off course during an experiment and pulled Howard to Earth. Something like that. Howard readies himself to use the laser to get back home, but an accident occurs and brings down a dark overlord of the universe, who takes possession of Dr. Jennings. And here's where Lucas's ILM and Jeffrey Jones take center stage. Jones is pretty good as he embodies this evil presence. 
His appearance deteriorates scene by scene, and the makeup and his performance make this guy a threatening entity. Things start to go on too long with him, though, and it starts to get a little tedious with me. In the diner scene, the Dark Overlord lets loose his powers, while Howard gets into some insipid fight with the patrons. Like, really, they're getting ready to cook him. It's just so stupid. Most of the special effects, which I'm sure they spent a lot of time on, I never thought were that impressive. Even when I first saw this in 86. It always felt like I just saw the same kind of stuff in Big Trouble in Little China. A movie I like much more than this, by the way. Some of the practical effects are cool. All the tables and chairs sliding to block the door. That looks really good. But all the glowing and purple stuff... Eh. The Overlord kidnaps Bev and heads to the laser to bring down more of his friends to take over the Earth. So it's up to Howard to save the day. As the Overlord drives around to nuclear power plants to get more power, he does this really freaky thing with this alien tongue. It's really weird and creepy. Howard has to escape from the cops. Yeah, why are the cops after him? Huh. Yeah, why is he running away from the cops? He goes to the laser, the thing explodes, then he has to run away from the cops. They're trying to kill him. Shoot to kill! Maybe I'm blanking. There are other scientists there who could tell the cops Howard and this chick are okay. This guy was around the whole time, and he knows the whole story. He could just tell them. They even arrest Phil. Huh. I guess it's a convenient enough excuse for the chase scenes. It's pretty flimsy reasoning, though. But it leads us to the 10-minute Astroglide chase. And I feel every minute of this. There's not really any tension to this whole thing. Howard and Phil are flying this thing, the cops are in pursuit, and it all feels like extended filler. They try to think up every little thing to make this a thrilling sequence, and it just falls flat. There's no excitement or suspense to any of it. It should be the opposite. Bev's in danger, and Howard is the only one who can save her, if he can get away from this army of cops. So he takes to the sky in this trippy little thing. Eh. The stunts are just... The cop cars crash. Again, there's a lot of time and energy spent to create some pretty dull results. Not surprisingly, we get some duck jokes, and Howard gets revenge on some duck hunters. That's the only thing that breaks up the monotony of Howard and Phil just screaming and acting all panicked. It's always the same thing. Howard looks back, then he looks ahead and screams that he's about to hit something, ah, and then he avoids it. Phil has to hang on for dear life. It gets really, really tedious. I'm actually surprised that this sequence is only 10 minutes long. I thought it was much longer. Howard, look in front of you. Ah! Uh. The Overlord takes Bev back to the Dynatechnics lab. Now no one is there, conveniently. For the remainder of the movie, Howard engages in a special effects battle with the Overlord. And it's not much of a battle. It's supposed to be a big, exciting climax with major stakes, and it's just boring again. At this point, I'm just watching it just to get it over with. I don't care about the story or what will happen if the overlords come down. And then, predictably, they have to do another duck joke. Prepare to eat beak. Eat lead? Eat, eat my dust? I don't know. I don't even understand that one. The special effects aren't that impressive, and it doesn't get me on the edge of my seat. Even when the Overlord leaves Jennings' body and is this wild crab-looking thing, the stop motion looks pretty decent. You can't do much better than this, but it doesn't blend in very well with the rest of this. Plus, Howard defeats this thing twice the same exact way. He shoots the thing with the laser on the golf cart. Even if they had him do something different to defeat the crabby thing, Say the laser doesn't hurt him, so he has to think of something else. That would have been something. Make it a tougher fight the second time around. But it's just the same exact thing as when he defeated the possessed Jennings. It's just such a humdrum fight. 
The big clincher to this is Howard having to destroy the big laser to stop the other overlords from coming to Earth, and sacrificing any chance of him getting back home. Howard, you gotta destroy it! Blast it! Get him! No, Howard, don't! Huh? We'll never get home. Goodbye, Duck World. And it ends with the big concert scene with Howard rocking his theme song and the audience getting all into it. Whatever. It always seemed like they just expected everyone to like Howard because he was a funny little duck who plays the guitar and wears Ray-Bans. Right. It's just not enough for me. That alone does not make him cool. Not a good movie. Is this what some label it as the worst movie ever made? No way. At least I don't think so. Maybe it's just I've seen too many movies. It's hard to tell from this review, but there are a few moments I like here and there. The love scene is decent. I like when Howard gets served eggs in the diner. Leah Thompson is hot, and I like Jones. Oh yeah, there was that big second thing I always liked about this movie. The music. The score by John Barry. It's almost too good for this movie. I always really liked this song, You're the Duckiest. It doesn't really help the movie, but it's still a good little tune. I don't think they use it very well in the movie, though. It sort of just comes in out of nowhere in scenes and just clumsily just crops up. Okay. Okay, fine. I mean, I just found something. Huh? I mean, somebody in a pretty weird predicament, and I was trying to help. I bet you were born from a very hard-boiled egg, Ducky. Yeah. 30 seconds to arrival. Get up! This world didn't treat you very good. But you saved it, didn't you? Even Howard's theme song with George Clinton lending a hand with the lyrics, it's pretty catchy. So no, I don't think Howard the Duck is the worst movie ever. I don't even think it's the worst movie Lucas has been associated with. I can easily say I like Howard the Duck much more than... What was that abysmal second one called? Attack of the Clones. Yes, I like Howard the Duck more than a Star Wars movie. What garbage that one was. Gerber's reaction to what Lucas and company did to his character was about as enthusiastic as the public's. He did like the actors, but said the movie Beverly and the movie Howard were not the characters he created. Gerber would get to revisit Howard in a six-issue miniseries in 2001. Howard morphs into a rat a nod to the problems Disney had with the early Howard appearances. Gerber died in 2008. Ironically, since Disney bought Marvel in 2009, I don't think there's much of an issue with Howard and his pants anymore. He could probably lose them now. The failure of Howard didn't affect Lucas much. It did become the first significant smear on his resume, and the first big sign to fans that this guy was fallible. But he would continue being involved with film and TV projects, mainly in the role of producer. His Star Wars empire would dominate the rest of his career, and earn him billions upon billions of bucks. When he finally decided to continue his Star Wars saga, and got back into the directing chair to tell a new trilogy, it would end up being greeted with much more hostility than his participation with Howard the Duck. Leah Thompson would say after the cold reaction Howard got, she found it difficult getting back to work but she continued doing films and TV movies. Her parts got smaller until she had a successful run as the lead in Caroline in the City. She would be best remembered as Lorraine in the Back to the Future movies. By the way, want a movie she did that was worse than Howard the Duck? Try sitting through Jaws 3D. She's cute in it, but holy mackerel. Same with Jones. He would continue his character acting duties in a whole range of films. He'll probably be best remembered as the principal in Ferris Bueller's Day Off. But I love him in Ed Wood. I was completely off with my prediction of Tim Robbins in this. I would have bet, at the time, the only place we'll see him again is selling used cars or something. Instead, he was able to manage to shake the stink of his association with Howard Offham and would have a successful acting career, even winning an Oscar. He sure came a long way from Fraternity Vacation and Howard. From their participation with Howard, Ewick and Katz wouldn't find a lot of work coming their way afterwards. 
I'm tempted to say Howard pretty much ruined their careers. The most notable thing they did after this was working on the screenplay for the 1994 Lucas-produced comedy, Radioland Murders. Despite them working with Lucas in the past, and being part of some pretty big hits, I guess the notoriety of Howard eclipsed all that and I really have no idea what they're doing nowadays. Speaking of Howard, what became of him? Well, he fared probably the worst out of this debacle. The worst movies of 1986. I'm what should have been huge exposure that was going to generate renewed excitement for the character, it did the opposite. When we come back, we'll look at a movie that literally grossed pennies for every dollar it cost to make, and it qualifies not just for this year, but as an all-time legendary bond. With an estimated $37 million budget, Howard the Duck would go on to gross 16 million bucks in the U.S., with an additional foreign gross of 21 million, which, when all added up, would about equal its budget. If only they'd started with a funny, likable duck in a comedy. Instead, they made a grim, worried duck in a special effects adventure, and then they filled the soundtrack with bittersweet and even downbeat music to be sure that we didn't get the feeling too good. It wasn't even close to being the biggest cinematic financial disaster ever, but it didn't matter in the public size. But instead, there is this wandering all over the case with the central character, the duck, the one that we're going to be rooting for, and our rooting interest in is neither funny nor um, uh, bitter funny, and it doesn't work at all. Howard would now be associated with being the star of one of the most well-known box office disasters ever. Everyone had fun throwing back the duck jokes at it, saying it laid a big egg and taking jabs at Lucas, the Emperor of Hollywood, and noting his track record has now been tarnished on a grand scale. Howard was viewed as a colossal turkey. The movie would now join that elite group of cinematic disasters that would become legend. Big budgeted embarrassments that helped end careers, made studios' bottom lines crash, and would become the brunt of countless jokes. Their titles would become shorthand for extravagant examples of Hollywood excess, and embarrassingly misjudged projects that would generate behind-the-scenes stories that would be much more interesting than anything that stuck to the screen. As time would go on, the public would become more and more fascinated with the weekly box office and the amount of money movies would take in every week. It would become as routine as looking at the stats of your favorite sports team. Box office lists are printed up for everyone to see and keep track of, making everyone feel like they're Hollywood insiders and have a personal stake in what's happening. People get a perverse enjoyment seeing dismal returns on such and such a movie. By late Friday night, a movie's fate is sealed and is already pegged as a hit, a disappointment, a bomb. Only one day, and everything is already determined. Sure, these movies have some fans. There's always going to be someone out there that likes a movie. But for the vast majority of moviegoers, these bombs would represent some of the most expensive and worst that Hollywood has tried giving audiences. And audiences flatly rejected them and made them members of this special group of films that no one wants to be a member of. That little oddball character of Gerber's who wandered into a comic panel in 1973 would mainly be forgotten, replaced by his cinematic equivalent, the duck who can play a guitar. Howard still has some fans who remember who he was and how special a duck he had been before that summer of 1986. Even today, with Marvel Studios churning out so many projects, there's hope that perhaps they could set their sights on Howard and finally make a movie or do some kind of project that would do him some justice. Of course, being able to get out of that infamous shadow of Lucas's big budget film will not be easy. It's going to be haunting Howard for a long, long time. What's this, the key to your duckmobile? Give me that, or you're gonna be sorry. You better oh. watch out, he's a master of quack food. <laughs> <laughs>